Okay, so you're live and everything, so. Okay, so we can go, Robert. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so it, it's a pleasure to uh, have Yannick Wisniewski, who's going to talk about quaternion Kähler manifolds for our algebraic torus actions on projective contact manifolds. Far away. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. I'm very pleased to be here joining this meeting from outside, uh, well, as everybody does actually. So, um, yes, so I'll be talking about the, um, the topic which is uh, in line with the, with the topic of the, of the Simon's collaboration scheme, but my view will be somehow uh, much more from the point of view of algebraic geometry. And I will report on, uh, on a project or a couple of projects, which I had with the uh, um, collaborators whose names are over here. So let me spell them out. So that was first a joint paper with Buczynski and Weber. And later uh, the Italian, say, generally the, the Italian Spanish part. So Romano, Oketta and Salaconde and everything is at this point at the, <clears throat> at the <clears throat> preprint server, the usual address. <clears throat> okay, so let me start with uh, recalling <clears throat> that the topic will be about the uh, lebrun Salomon conjecture. Uh, and that's the major motivation for this work, uh, which comes from the Romanian uh, differential geometry. And it can be spelled out that positive quaternion Kähler manifolds are symmetric spaces. But for me, more interesting thing, oops, I have to learn how to use it, is the algebraic uh, geometric version, which, uh, is about Fano manifolds. So if you take a compact Fano manifold and you assume that it admits a complex contact structure, then the conjecture asserts that it is supposed to be homogeneous. Uh, actually, this version is slightly stronger than uh, uh, the original conjecture. Uh, the link is the twister space. And actually it was established one direction by Lebon and the other by, by Simon, Simon Salomon. Well, who's watching me, I can see. And uh, namely, if you take the twister space of, of a positive quaternion Kähler manifold, then it comes to be a contact uh, Fano manifold. And moreover, which is not uh, assumed in this second algebraic version, of this conjecture, it admits Einstein metric, and therefore, and this will be the major, um, well, actually, it will be the blanket assumption for my talk, uh, the group of its automorphism is, is, is reductive. So my blanket assumption is that uh, uh, whenever I talk about a Fano contact manifold, then I assume that its automorphism group is reductive. Okay, let's see. And the main results, which I would like to explain, are formulated in the uh, algebraic geometric way. Namely, uh, the, mm, the first one is, uh, well, so I didn't actually spell it out so far. Let me see. No, the end didn't appear that a mistake, but suppose that we have a final contact manifold of dimension of complex dimension to n plus one, then if n is smaller or equal than four, then x is homogeneous. <clears throat> and if there is a group of, of automorphism of x and its rank is bigger than two or n minus three over two, then it is homogeneous. So in particular, uh, if we take uh, contact manifolds uh, uh, of odd dimension, then uh, the 
theorem A says that up to dimension nine, uh, the contact manifolds, um, complex contact manifolds are uh, <clears throat> homogeneous. And uh, uh, theorem B says something about the, those which admit a group um, of ha sufficiently uh, high rank. And the corollary, which is in the in the realm of differential geometry, is about positive quaternion Kähler manifolds, and this goes to uh, to the direction of uh, lebrun salamon conjecture, namely, if, if n is less than or equal than four, or this quaternion Kähler manifold is of dimension sixteen at most, uh, then uh, it's a wall space. Or if um, this quaternion Kähler manifold admits a faithful action of a torus of rank and the rank is the same as of the algebraic group, uh, then it is symmetric. Okay. Let me now look at the, at the definition of final contact manifolds because um, in the course of the talk I will come back to um, the assumptions which which are here. So uh, uh, we are in the complex situation uh, and we will consider a complex uh, line bundle. Uh, and in addition, we assume that it's it's ample. And this comes with the positivist, positivity assumption. Uh, ample for me will mean that certain multiplicity of this line bundle uh, is uh, a, a pullback of the structural shift or of one shift over the projective space. So in other words, there exists an embedding of, of X into the projective space so that this L uh, becomes uh, uh, the restriction of the structural shift of one. And then the contact form is the twisted form such that the um, is differential to the nth power uh, capped with the with itself uh, vanishes nowhere. Uh, this in particular implies it's as it's written here. Uh, this in particular implies that the uh, the anti-canonical divisor. So the anti-canonical divisor. Let me do the annotation. So minus kx is just the de determinant of the complex uh, uh, cotangent bundle. This is omega. And another way of spelling it is as follows. We have this uh, theta. We can think about this theta as the map from the uh, from uh, sub core rank one sub bundle. So a distribution and L is the quotient. So if we take this d theta, then it defines a, a bilinear map. And the non-degeneracy is just to say that this bilinear map is nowhere degenerate. Okay, so this is a skew symmetric pairing. So this is exactly the same as you would uh, uh, say in the in the differential case. Uh, except that everything is complex, which makes a big difference, as it turns out. Because in general, then the contact structures in, in differential geometries are rather common, while here, this, this version of the lebrun salomon conjecture says that they are very rare and actually limited to a few cases. Actually, the, the conjecture which I want to discuss in the language of algebraic geometry says that the, the manifold satisfying these two assumptions uh, is actually a closed orbit in the projectivization of a joint representation of a simple algebraic group. So we have a classification of simple algebraic groups and for each one there exists only one uh, contact manifold. This is what the theorem, or, or rather the, the conjecture says. Okay, and uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout this talk, the rank of G is the rank of the maximal algebraic 
torus in this in this group G. Let's look at the diagram which we have here. So I try to compare in this diagram the uh, the dimension either of the contact of the or the um, quaternion Kähler manifold, which stand this N stands for the dimension. So in case of the compact complex, it's of the complex dimension to n plus one. And R, which is over here, is the rank of this simple group. And here we have the uh, distribution of dots, which presents all the, uh, the relation of these two invariants for the, for the simple group. So the red dots are those classical groups of the A and C series. So th this is SL and SP groups, while the BD uh, groups are the orthogonal uh, classical group or, or orthogonal linear, special orthogonal uh, linear groups and uh, the blue dots. Then we have a number of the of the blank dots and there are those uh, exceptional groups. And what this diagram says is uh, how the um, present knowledge um, of this um, of this postulation postulated uh, Lebrun uh, Salaman conjecture um, looks from the point of view of these two variables. So first of all, I should say that uh, um, the low dimensional cases, so the cases which are over here, uh, so the dimension uh, n equal one uh, was done by Pun and Salomon, then n equal two, so the fan of fivefold was done by Druel. And then there was uh, a result by Bilavsky, which captured this red uh, dots over here, namely his results. Uh, Asserted that the, uh, if the if the rank of the of the torus is of the linear form, uh, I think slightly below the this this red dot line, then uh, then the Lebrun Salomon conjecture holds. And then there is this other line which we can see over here, and this is the fang line. Uh, so his results were uh, formulated in a more or similar way. If the rank is bigger or equal than the line, uh, if the if the rank of the of the automorphous group is bigger or equal uh, than than this line indicates, then uh, the groups are known. And now this yellowish region is the unknown region uh, in the view of the theorem A and B which means that everything above this yellowish region is already captured by the, uh, by the two theorems, which I mentioned. So the, uh, the low dimensional cases are over here. They are uh, known without any assumption. And then there is this line uh, and this, uh, assumption that rank is bigger equal than two. Then I made this dotted region at the bottom of the um, of this picture to indicate the actual uh, scheme of the proof because it turns out that uh, the crucial uh, work has to be done for groups of rank two. And uh, the scheme of the proof, which I will explain is the reduction to uh, to the rank two case uh, plus some technical assumption, which I will explain in a moment. Okay, let me check it. Now, uh, again, a summary of the of the results, which have been known so far. So small dimensions, uh, which I already uh, said were were done. There, there is this Herrera Herrera result in dimension uh, seven, which didn't really hold. And then, uh, then the the results of Bilaski and Fang and the results of Bouvier, uh, which I will explain in a moment. Uh, namely, uh, uh, Bouvier result uh, was formulated for the. Um, for 
complex manifolds. And uh, in this diagram, which I just drawn a moment ago, uh, we have um, uh, we have the maybe I will go to the next line, okay? In the in the line which I in the sequence which I've drawn just a moment ago, there was this f t x and then map to l to the line bundle l. So this is this theta form which in which can be written as the map from t t x to l. Then it turns out that if we pass to the uh, uh, to the global sections, then this uh, arrow over here can be inverted, and actually we can interpret the sections of the line bundle as the uh, those vector fields which preserve the the contact structure. So actually, uh, using this observation. Uh, but we'll prove that the, if there are enough forms to make a birational map of this of this variety X into the projective space, well, actually not birational, but if generically the map is uh, uh, of maximal rank, uh, then the uh, then the um, uh, the Lebrun Salomon conjecture holds. Uh, Right, so uh, uh, there is also another series of examples for which uh, the Lebrun Salomon is known. This is this red dot series, C -N -N -A -N, but um, captured in another way. Uh, namely, if, uh, if we assume that the uh, Picard group is not generated, so the, the H2 cohomology, is not the generated by the class of the line bundle L, then we are in the situation of either the projective space or the projectivization of the uh, tangent bundle of the projective space. And uh, mm, uh, the first one, as it turns out, follows from, uh, from a classical result by uh, Kobayashi and Ochiai and this uh, observation that the canonical divisor is a multiple of the of the of this L of the sample L. So in the in the first result, it turns out that uh, that we are exactly in the in the situation of a, a Kobayashi Ochiai result, which asserts that the projective space is exactly the 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 complex. Uh, compact manifold such that the ample bundle, uh, the dimension plus one multiplicity of the ample line bundle gives the anti canonical divisor. Uh, so that's the case C. And the case A, which means this pair, uh, uh, well, that's the only uh, um, Fano manifold, Fano contact manifold, which has the second Betty number which is bigger than one. Uh, then LeBron and Salomon observed that uh, um, uh, since it's, it's of large index, then by the classification of uh, Fano manifolds, uh, this uh, contact uh, manifold is supposed to be exactly the adjoint orbit uh, for, the, uh, for the A series. So this is the, the status of the of the of the results which were previously, and now let's pass to the to the language which I would like to use in this talk. So uh, I will deal with algebraic torus of rank R. I will denote it by H, and uh, uh, I will consider characters. Uh, which are well algebraic maps uh, from so my characters the lattice of the characters are the homomorphisms from the torus H to the um, multiplicative group of C so C star and uh, both will be of of rank R uh, as indicated here and. Uh, 
uh, we will assume that this edge acts uh, almost faithfully. So the kernel of the action is uh, at most finite on the per x l, which means that there, there exists an action of, well, th this almost faithful action on x, but there exists a linearization. So the lift up of the action to, to l. And this mu, which I introduced over here, will be used in, in also in different contexts, which I will explain just in a moment. Uh, but at this point, let me note the, the standard observation at the, at, the, at the very base of the theory of the algebraic torus action, that if you consider the, um, the set of the fixed points, then uh, there is a decomposition of the set into connected smooth components. Okay, that's the first observation, which does not depend on the linearization. And there is the second observation, which depends on the linearization, that the linearization, so the choice of mu, uh, determines the decomposition of the, of the space of the section of this line bundle uh, into the eigenspaces of this of this action and uh, then then the indices over here of this of the decomposition are some um, some characters here and actually uh, we can take the set of these of these characters so they are the eigenvalues of this action and uh, for uh, in in our interest will be to understand the uh, polytope which will be the convex hull. So this is a polytope. That's one, one of the major uh, actors of this, of this approach. And incidentally, there is also another polytope which will play the game over here. Namely, uh, we can take uh, the fixed points. So Y eyes, uh, Y eyes are the fixed points. Then if I have, sorry about that, okay. So if I have the, the yi, uh, then I can take a general point or whatever the point in yi, I can take the fiber uh, of this line bundle yi, and then the action of the torus on this fiber, since this is the fixed point, will be given by a character. And this is exactly this character in the lattice M, uh, with respect to which this action on this fiber can be described. And again, I define the polytope, which is the convex hull in all of these, of these characters which describe the action with respect to this linearization. And of course, everything over here is modeled on the, uh, on the, uh, on the theory of the toric varieties. Uh, well, however, in case of the toric varieties, usually if you start with the smooth ones, then um, immediately you have uh, uh, both polytops being equal and actually they describe the, the moment map for this torus action. Uh, the point is that the huge difference here is that uh, this polytope behaves very nicely linearly. So if I take the multiple of the line bundle in question, then the polytope gets multiplied as well, while this does not. Uh, and actually, as you see, if L has no section, then this is just an empty set. So however, if the line bundle is span, then I have the equality of this. So in general, I have the inclusion of these two polytops. And the good situation is if I have the equality. So if, if, if L is spanned, then I have the equality of these two polytops, which will be very convenient situation for us. Oops, uh, sorry. Okay. And <clears throat> among all these components uh, of this fixed point locus of the action, I would like to consider some which will play a significant role and it will be seen um, why. 
namely those which are associated to uh, to the extreme all points to the vertices of this polyton. So I take the convex hull and the, the vertex will uh, is associated to uh, to a component. Actually, a priori, uh, well, you may have multiple components associated to the inner points of this polytope, but uh, as we, as it will turn out, uh, for reasons which I will explain in a moment, the extremal components are defined uniquely. Okay, now let me restate uh, the theorem which I promised to be uh, like a partial uh, version of the theorem B. Uh, namely, the proof of the theorem B will go through the proof of the theorem C. So we start uh, with the contact manifold. Again, I take the pair XL. Uh, and I assume, and from now on, this is the blanket assumption that L generates the Picard group. So the, the first chain class of L generates the second cohomology of X. Uh, then uh, here we have a very modest assumption, which is that the rank of the contact automorphism is, is reductive, which is my blanket assumption and of rank Two at least. Let me know that by this observation, this is fulfilled if the uh, the number of sections is uh, four at most, uh, at least. So this looks very modest, right? Mm. If I can provide that my generator of the of the of the second cohomology has enough sections, at least four. Then, then it will be nice. But the second one is, <laughs> is a very technical assumption. Namely, uh, and actually hard to check, I think. Uh, namely, uh, uh, we want to assume that the, the action of the maximal torus in this group of the, of the automorphism has isolated points as the extremal fixed points. Okay, so this is this does not look that nice to get verified, and the conclusion is as as you expect uh, is that uh, the Lebrun Salmon conjecture holds. So the uh, this G is simple and XL is the closed orbit in the projectivization of the of the adjoint representation. Okay, so let's pass. Uh, to uh, overview of the techniques which are used in, in this argument. And, and actually, as I told you uh, at the very beginning, that's, that's the result uh, of um, actually three or four papers. And I think that the techniques are very interesting, at least for me, turned out to be very, very interesting and in some sense uh, also useful uh, for, uh, for different purposes. So the first set of techniques um, is the, are the discrete methods for the action of this big torus. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them grid data and grids and downgrading and restriction. And they are modeled uh, either on, you can link them. Uh, there is an obvious link to, uh, to, to toric varieties but also to the, the varieties for which you can use the uh, goreski kotwitz macpherson uh, uh, language of GKM graphs. I will explain it just in a moment. Then there is the second uh, set of uh, observations, which we, I'll try to explain uh, today, is the birational geometry of the C-star action. So uh, uh, that's one of the of the fundaments of the birational, say, the modern birational geometry, uh, actually cultivated by by Reed, Tadels, and later by Morelli and Vodacek, that uh, the C star action uh, is uh, kind of the basic 
tools to understand the birational geometry of algebraic varieties. And I will try to explain this. So in the course of, of these proofs, we used something which is associated to the, to the notion of the algebraic cobordis by Morelli and Wodacic, and also classical Cremona transformation. And uh, the last set of tools uh, is, is rather natural and uh, very well known, but essential for our argument that the Białynski Birula decomposition for the for the um, sister action and equivalent cohomology. Okay, now let's pass through the through this notion which I introduced here. I mean, at least the name, the grid data. What's the grid data? So um, and now X does not have to be contact because this is a fairly general definition. So we have a pair XL with an action of the torus. Uh, we take the linearization. We have the splitting of the fixed point set into the connected components. And then the grid data by definition consists of these components. So we take the isomorphous classes of these components. That's our first uh, uh, ingredient of this data, then for every component, we consider its co-normal and the splitting co-normal into the eigenspaces of the action. And the eigenspaces, uh, or rather the eigenweights of this action, uh, by definition, we will call compass of the action. Well, maybe it's, it's too romantic a name for this thing. But nevertheless, it's uh, that that's convenient. And the, then the then the third thing, uh, which already appeared, that uh, once we have the linearization of, of this action, um, then over the fixed point components we can choose the uh, the uh, the weights on which the uh, the torus acts or on the fibers of this L. So we have the map from the formal map from the set of the components to M. In particular, a very special situation is if these are points, then we are in the situation of some embedding of this GKM graph into the M, the lattice M. Uh, namely, uh, then, uh, okay, so as you look at this data, it, it has like two components. One is the geometry. So these are the, these YIs and these are these components. And the other are purely uh, combinatorial or, or discrete. So these are these weights and these are uh, the eigenvalues of the action, okay? So in some sense, uh, the uh, the grid data and this is the the last line on this slide if i only manage to have it over here so the grid data is what you really need to calculate the cohomologies of the or rather the Euler characteristic formally the Euler characteristic of this multiples of this line bundle m so there is this riemann um, the Lefschetz version of the riemann roch theorem, which calculates the equivariant cohomology for the for these multiples, which turns out to be very useful. Okay, so in particular, once I determine the grid data for a variety with a polarized variety, so a variety with an ample line bundle and the action, I I already know a lot of things about this variety. So let's do one example, because this is always instructive, at least I consider it instructive. So let's take the first variety, uh, in some sense, the easiest variety, which is not toric, and uh, which admits the action of the torus of core rank. I mean, the, the rank of the torus is by once more than the dimension of the variety. And it has the uh, isolated fixed points. So we take the quadric. So this is four dimensional quadric given by the equation as above. Uh, you verify that actually the, uh, the coordinates, 
so the points which have uh, only one coordinate being non-zero, the data being zero, are the fixed points of this action. Uh, the action, by the way, that's the that's the formula for the action, right? So uh, that's the formula for the action, and clearly this preserves the uh, the this quadric. The fixed points are the the coordinate points. And then the, uh, at each of these points, that, so they are in particular isolated, and the compass at each of these points is described over here. Uh, well, it's fair, fairly stra straightforward, and you can check it easily. And I actually introduced this example because I want to introduce the, the notion of the downgrading and the reduction. Uh, which will be like a standard tool for this argument, which I want to explain. So suppose that uh, we take a sub torus of this torus and we take the quotient torus. So H1 is a sub torus, H2 is the quotient torus. And uh, I'm interested in the, in the sequence of the lattices of the character. So it is, it is inverted. And so what will be the downgrading? The downgrading will be the action of H2. So I, I have a very nice torus maybe acting on X and I choose a sub torus and downgrade the action. So I, I just take a smaller torus, right? But then if I take a fixed point component of the smaller torus, then the quotient torus acts on the fixed point uh, components and actually for every fixed point component the components of this quotient action on the fixed co point component of the smaller torus are exactly those components of the biggest torus so the torus h restricted to this well and moreover actually the uh, this restriction formula holds for for all the data in the sense that uh, if you want to understand the, the grid data for the smaller torus, you just take the projection associated, so uh, associated projection of the lattices, but also on the fiber of this projection, you can recover the grid data of the action of this quotient torus on the fixed point components of this uh, sub torus. Let me explain how it how it works on this example, which I introduced just a moment ago. So this is the quadric, right? Which I pictured just a moment ago. Then I take the action of one dimensional torus, which is actually the, the diagonal torus in this three dimensional torus. So on the odd components, it, it acts with weight one, on the even components with, the arc, with weight minus one. And then from the point of view of, of lattices, this is just the projection of my previous picture on the line. And the funny thing is I chose this so that actually, uh, instead of the uh, six points, six isolated points of this three dimensional torus action, I obtain two huge components, uh, which uh, as you may presume are just P2s. They are the opposite P2s determined by the by the equation x2, x4, x6 equals zero and vice versa, right? And so the, there should be a warning here. If I choose a general sub torus and I take the projection, then it will have, um, uh, it will not be as good because I will not separate the fixed points. So for a general choice of uh, say one dimensional uh, sub torus, uh, the number of the components will not change. So in some sense, I, I lose every information which I have from the fact that the large torus acts uh, uh, and I don't gain anything. But if I choose a good sub torus, then I can somehow uh, consider uh, the sections of the variety and try to recover the, its structure by by looking uh, through this procedure, okay? I hope that I explained this. And now the plan of the proof. So the plan of the proof of this theorem goes 
through three steps. <laughs> uh, uh, so, as I said, theorem B essentially is the reduction to the theorem C. Uh, while theorem A actually is based on the estimates by, by Simon uh, of the dimension of H0. But in both cases, we start uh, the, with the following observation that possibly the, uh, the polytop, so uh, all the grid data which lives in the polytop uh, is in a in high dimension. But uh, if, we, if we have the appropriate uh, estimate on the rank of the of the uh, of the torus acting on this variety uh, we can choose our projection of this polytope which is associated to a sub torus choice so that uh, the um, uh, the sections uh, will get an extent maybe i should make it more specific Okay, so our task at this point, so task is to prove that at the end of this, I want to have the delta to be gamma. Okay, a priori, I don't know it, but so I start with delta. So that's my polytop, which is possibly high dimensional. Uh, and uh, I know the rank estimate on the action with respect to the dimension. And each of these faces, which are over here, uh, represents some subvariety, which is actually in the in the realm of the contact varieties will, will be a Legendrian subvariety. And therefore it will be of dimension uh, less than half. And then I'm taking the, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, Saptoras acting on this, uh, uh, well, or rather the other way around. I'm looking at, at, at the torus uh, and downgrading this as in the previous picture to lower dimensional case. Then I'm looking at the quotient torus uh, uh, acting on this facet. And then I'm saying, okay, uh, uh, if, this, uh, if this is of rank, of high rank, uh, um, action, then I can uh, figure out what this variety is. If it is not, then I repeat this inductive procedure to understand that at the very end, I will, and this is where the bielinski birula theorem intervenes, that at the very end, I can extend the sections uh, from, from the, the vertices to the whole thing, uh, to the whole uh, variety re represented here by the polytop. I think that I, I, I did it too quick, but this is just the, say the first step of this argument. And now I want to concentrate on the other step. So once we are reduced to the two dimensional uh, case, uh, we, we want to show that these two polytops agree. The, um, uh, this is again obtained by the by the similar technique, and uh, if we go over it, then we uh, let me recall that we observed that uh, uh, that the section of this represent the global vector fields which are associated uh, to the contact automorphism of this variety X, and. Uh, Again, using uh, uh, the arguments coming from the bielinski birula uh, theorem, uh, we, we come to the conclusion that, the, uh, that this is the Lie algebra uh, associated to a simple group. So once we are in the dimension two, this is a root polytope for a simple group which has to be of the type A2 or G2. Okay, so that's a very rough idea how it works. I will concentrate in the last two slides on this part, 
which technically actually is the most involved and this is actually the contents of at least of two papers in this in the in the series of four is associated to understanding this part and then the last argument the last part of the argument is as i indicated is using the left shift riemann rock to recover the uh, first uh, the Poincaré polynomial for this line bundle L. And then once we know the Poincaré polynomial for this line bundle L, and we know that the group acting is uh, simple, we can actually recover the, the group action uh, on, the, on this X. We can uh, uh, find out why this group uh, is acting uh, on X as it acts on the adjoint variety uh, on the closed orbit uh, in the adjoint representation, so on the adjoint variety. So that's the sketch of the of this proof, and let me concentrate on this birational part because I think that's the most, in some sense, for me, it was the most amazing. Okay, so uh, here is uh, the picture which we want to analyze, namely. Uh, uh, we have the the plain uh, pictures. We we assume that we are already at the situation when we have the action of the group of the A two or G two type. Uh, so um, so it is this hexagon uh, which is our polytope, and by the by by our assumption, the vertices are associated to isolated points of the action. And uh, then uh, the, these uh, red and orange arrows indicate possible um, distribution of the eigenweights of the action on the tangent uh, or on the normal uh, bundle. So uh, this is our compass at each of these points. Uh, and uh, there is the symmetry in this compass, which comes from the from the contact structure, because the the contact structure determines the uh, this uh, skew symmetric bilim bilinear form, which essentially means that uh, we have a pairing in these uh, eigen uh, eigen uh, values so that uh, they pairwise add to the value of L, which is, uh, which is actually this, this vector uh, <coughs> stemming from the original point to the center of, of the picture. Uh, why this is interesting? Because um, the next step uh, will be using this fact to, to analyze the C star action for the uh, for the downgraded sections of this of this picture, so essentially with all this preparatory work, which is using let me repeat uh, the 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 discrete type of our arguments plus Bielinski Virula to extend sections, uh, we are bound to analyze uh, the C star action of two type of varieties. So if we look. Uh, this picture, that's the cross section, one cross section. And as you see, we have a, a variety where, on which we have the action of C star via this uh, downgrading and restriction procedure. And we have at most four possible uh, fixed point components. I mean, here I can have multiple fixed point components. Uh, and here are the isolated points. And the other possibility is the cross section which goes through the center and it, uh, it contains three at most. Uh, let me explain how is it related to the, to the birational geometry. Okay, so from now on, I somehow concentrated on the on the purely algebraic uh, question of understanding uh, uh, projective varieties, projective complex varieties with a C star action. So uh, uh, 
again, now XL is not necessarily a contact variety. Actually, it is not a contact variety because this is obtained by this cross section, by this reduction uh, from a contact variety to some uh, fixed point component of, of some uh, porous action. And uh, so given a line bundle and the linearization and ample line bundle, we define the bandwidth of the action. So remember that mu in this case assumes the value in the in characters of C star, so in Z. So this mu, that is the, the, the eigenvalues of the action of the C star on, uh, on the fibers of L over the fixed points, assumes the highest and the smallest value. So that's the, <coughs> the bandwidth is the difference of this. And uh, I will say that the action is equalized if the action uh, on the normal has eigenvalues plus or minus. So in some sense, this is the best possible situation. Why? In particular, if we, <coughs> in this case, I can identify the bandwidth with the degree of this uh, of this line bundle on a general orbit of this action. Okay, so if I go back to the previous picture, then I'm interested in understanding two types of varieties. So that's one variety, that's the other variety. This is of bandwidth <coughs> three, this is of bandwidth two. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, by this uh, compass type of argument. So using the contact form, I know that this action is equalized. Okay, and that's the theorem D. So assume that we have equalized action. Now Z, well, Z is arbitrary variety. I sh actually, I should have put Z over here as well. So suppose that we have a sister action of band with three on a pair ZL and assume that the extremal points uh, are isolated as it is the case in the, uh, in, the in our situation, then uh, the result is that the, the, the classification of these pairs uh, is very simple. We have three cases. So one is a scroll. So this is a projective bundle <coughs> structure over P1. The other is the product of a quadric and P1. And the third, well, it's homogeneous. And there are exactly four types of homogeneous varieties which can be considered. And I've put here the, uh, the names for them. It's not really important how they are uh, really called because of the following observation. Uh, these three cases essentially are associated to the three types of groups which, uh, which we consider and to which we want eventually reduce our, our theorem. So the scroll case is not really interesting because this is like a, a reminiscence of a variety which does not satisfy the assumptions that we put. The second case, the quadric case, is actually the case of the group SO type. So this is B and B and, and DN. And these three cases, these four cases, sorry, which I have over here, are actually uh, uh, stemming from these four exceptional groups. As you see, there is this three over here, which comes from the four over here, this five, which comes from the six, etc., And essentially, <coughs> this is because that the reduction decrease the rank of the torus acting, okay? Okay, so the last slide I'm about to finish, I want, don't want to go in overtime. So the last slide is essentially to see how the this rational, uh, by rational geometry, which is the, described over here, uh, leads to classical problems in algebraic geometry. Okay, so uh, this is a general observation. So suppose that we have, again, a sister action uh, on a pair uh, and 
uh, then for the, I promise to explain why the extremal points uh, are uh, really associated, the extremal points, the vertices of the, uh, of the delta polytope actually are associated to unique components of the fixed point set. Well, this is because if we reduce to, to one dimensional case and uh, always by taking appropriate downgrading, I can reduce the, the situation to one dimensional case. Uh, the external components are so-called source and the sink of the action. So this is where a generic point diverge or converges depending on, on which direction you would take of the action. So if you take a general point, so suppose that you take X in this X and you take, which is sufficiently general, then you take the limit of T X, then it will, if T goes to zero, then it will be in the component, which is Y plus, which will be one of the two extremal components. And if you take the limit at the infinity, that will be the, <coughs> the other component, which I call Y minus, okay? And, uh, uh, and this is where the birational geometry comes. Because if we assume for a moment that these two components are divisors, then I have a birational map, namely uh, for a generic point in, 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 so suppose that this is say Y plus and this is Y minus. So I have orbits, a general orbit starts over here, that's for zero and for infinity it's over here. So this, this gives a birational map from this component to this component. It's of course, it's not always, defined because in between you may have other components. Uh, so essentially the structure of this of this action looks like uh, the, a generic orbit goes like this, but some, some orbits uh, diverge here, then they split, they go. So essentially th this is how you can see a birational map. And that's the paradigm by uh, by Reed and, and Tadeus, all by rational maps should more or less look like this. Okay, so uh, how is it related to our case? Uh, well, uh, in our case, since the action is equalized, then blowing up the components uh, will give the divisors as the fixed point components. This is not true if the action is not equalized, but if the action is equalized, then since uh, then locally, uh, well, on the normal, I have just one eigenvalue, therefore the blow up will give the divisor, which will be the, the fixed point component. And therefore, so the bottom line is uh, that in our situation, maybe I clear this, that in our situation, we started with two points we had isolated points uh, for our C star action as the sink and the source. And then therefore we get a birational transformation of projective space. So this is a Cremona transformation. And since this is of bound with two, then this is a quadratic transformation. And by looking the way uh, it, it, it behaves, so by looking at the components in between, uh, we, or you can figure out that this is resolved by a single blow up. And this is a very much classical stuff. So it goes back to, uh, to classical Italian geometry. So you have all these Segre varieties, then it was uh, completed by Zach and, um, and Shepard Baron, who proved that there are exactly four Cremona quadratics transformations which are resolved by a single blow up. And guess what? They're actually associated to the situation that we want to. So they're associated to the four uh, exceptional groups. So F4, E6, E7, and E8. And I think that I didn't go in overtime. That, that's the last slide. If you have any question, I will be delighted to answer. Thank you.
I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try and find how to clap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so if you have any questions, maybe you can raise a hand. Uh, maybe you could unshare. Your, I can um, see Jason. Uh, raise Jason. Hand. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so um, thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering, I mean, you have this dimensional restriction. Do you, do you have any hope of, you know, what can uh, you do? To uh, let me go back to the slide. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question, of course. <laughs> Let me explain my view on this. Uh, first of all, uh, you have the, uh, this uh, uh, thing that a priori, the line bundle L does not have to have any section. I mean, that's the only way, I mean, using Simon's uh, approach, that's the only way that you can start the whole thing and make any group acting. So if you have any group acting, then perhaps there is a chance that you can do something. So essentially uh, moving above the, <laughs> the horizontal line is the first obstacle. Uh, then there is this rank assumption there. Uh, uh, so passing, as I told you, I, I was rather clumsy in explaining how you go uh, in this region down to this uh, two-dimensional case. But certain improvements are possible. And essentially, at the very bottom of this, if you look at it, there is this classical, I don't know, conjecture. I, I don't think even, I don't even think that people in, 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 in algebraic geometry, they would call it a conjecture in arbitrary dimension. In dimension three, it was known as existence of elephants by Reed. And usually that they would say that this is the expectation by Kavamata. So essentially what one needs is to have a non-trivial section for Fano manifold. If you have a Fano manifold uh, with the Picard group equals Z, then the expectation is that the generator should have a section, at least, well. And a part of the story is just to using this result uh, for the situation when you can actually prove this. So up to dimension five or six, then you are good. Then, then you can move down. But otherwise, I have no idea how to do it. So passing from here to here, I have no idea, frankly. So, well, but on the other hand, I hope, as I told you, I'm, I'm looking as a poor algebraic geometer to, into this. So maybe, maybe there is a way of seeing it better from your angle, right? So mm -hmm. to, just to find a group that it would move the whole thing and you could start to, to, to deal with, the, with these arguments. I think that the, sorry, I don't want to, to, to abuse your patience, but I think that uh, the, here, what we use is a systematic uh, discretization of the problem. Uh, and it turned out to be pretty useful. And the other observation is that we really realized that using the equivariant cohomology, I didn't explain that, that part either, but using the equivariant cohomology can answer the question how to decide uh, when a variety is a homogeneous. Okay, right. Great, thank you very much. So, Jarek, are you saying that your line, your, I don't know, can I call it the Polish line or something? Yeah. Is that the last? It's multiple, is, multiple. <laughs> is that Italian. the, Italian, yeah, okay. The, is that the last word in, as far as your approach goes, that line, do you think, or? or? No, 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 no. Uh, what I'm trying to say, the more you know about the, uh, this, what I would call the Kavamata conjecture, you would go down over here. But you can't, go, can... too, you can't go too far down. Uh, well, <laughs> yes. Because I, mean, of, I, I, mean, I... Yeah, I mean, it's striking, it's striking in these things that the exceptional groups, they sort of put a spanner in the works. You know, there was another result that uh, if, if the fourth Betty number of a quaternion Kähler thing is one, then you know you can prove that it's um, 
a wolf space, but of course that, that proof only works below dimension, quaternionic dimension seven, because there's F4 that gets in the way that has yeah. probability yeah. number two. So there's always, you know, the existence of these exceptional spaces sort of limits the, the sort of... So in some sense, we, we are good in, in the sense that uh, this this argument of using maybe I I should explain it better because this is really easy. Once you have this grid data, you can find the Hilbert or Poincaré Hilbert polynomial for the line bundle L with weights, which is important. And uh, essentially, on the other hand, if you think about the whole representation theory then the representation theory is identification of representation of groups or simple groups by weights of the action of the big torus. So the bottom line is, since you know that this restriction is faithful, so you can establish what kind of representation uh, you are dealing with by knowing the weights of the big torus action. And on the other hand, you can really recover the weights of the big torus action by this equivalent cohomology, then you are good. That's the bottom line. So the, the idea is rather easy. So, and this, these guys, they, they, you don't have to know them. It's enough that you know how the representation of these two, of these guys look like, that's it. Okay, any, any other questions? I saw Claude somewhere. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, I arrived quite late. I, I got the time wrong. <laughs> I'll have to go b back to YouTube and watch the, the lecture uh, recorded. Right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I wanted to say is not really related to the talk, but seeing this really for the first time, this curve, you know, the curve of the exceptional spaces, you know, that's flattening now to E8, one mm -hmm. wonders whether you know, the, the, these infinite dimensional Lie algebras, whether there's something that corresponds to a wolf space for E11 or, you know, my colleague Peter West. I don't know if there's some physicists who can shed some light on this, but, you know, they're, they're very keen to study E11 and E, well, particularly E11, you know, one. Okay. It, May I tell you something exciting that, I mean, which does not refer to really to this topic, but it turned out to be really embedded in this topic. And then, uh, because after I dealt with the Italian team, I went to the Applied Mathematics Institute. And then they're interested in, uh, in calculating, well, something uh, for the algebraic statistics, uh, which eventually can be boiled down to inversion of matrices or calculating the uh, Cremona transformation of inversion of matrices. And it turns out that these guys that, that are appearing in the picture are actually, can be described in terms of, uh, they are just inversion of particular types of, of matrices. So these objects appear, uh, okay, they are so special that they have to pop out somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you, you also mentioned, you mentioned Nick Shepard Barron, he uses Cremona transformations for cryptography. Uh, Yes. Uh, any other questions? Otherwise, if not, is there any other questions? I don't know if I see hands. Do I come to the front?